We're very lucky today to have Sarbani Roth present on Bhakti Yoga today. Yes, thank you, Deborah. And uh, are we good to go? Yes. Okay. Om Gurave Nama. So today we are going to start on this uh, very large topic of Bhakti Yoga. And uh, I'm going to start with the uh, conceptual uh, points. And so in that sense that this first half of the session may be a little bit heavy and probably bringing together a lot of the points that most of you esteemed astrologers already know. So bhakti means a devotion, right? And absolute love and spiritual union with the Supreme Divine, with the God. And that is different from following any coded uh, practices of religion. So when we're going to start talking about bhakti yoga, we are uh, first going to start by defining what is religion and then what is bhakti and how is bhakti different from religion and how do we see religion and bhakti in the horoscope and why are the houses which are shown for bhakti and for religion what is the the cause for that so here you can see over here a little photograph. Uh, this is of uh, ancient painting of Mirabai. And the reason I have put uh, the painting of Mirabai is that Mirabai is an iconic epitome of Bhakti Rasa in uh, the Hindu uh, mythology. And she was this uh, great queen and this great princess who gave everything up and she was completely spent her life besotted with the divine love of Krishna and she became a yogini. So whenever here anybody talks about uh, bhakti, uh, people talk about Mira, uh, the first thing. People also talk about uh, Krishna and Krishna's gopis and Krishna and Radha and as well as Krishna and Yashoda. Now the relationship between Krishna and Yashoda is that Yashoda was the foster mother of Sri Krishna and Yashoda completely was in love with him, just the way any mother is in love with her child. And she would love him, she would admonish him, she would spank him. She did not have any memory that Sri Krishna was a spark of the divine. She treated him as any other child. And this rasa of bhakti is called vatsalya. Vatsalya means that which stems from children, that you're loving God like a mother loves the child. The love that Sri Radhika had for Sri Krishna, the total absolutely mesmerizing love, the pangs of separation, that is supposed to be more like a lover's love, you know? So it shows that in a variety of different ways, you can actually love the divine. And this love, this love approach to the divine, whether as a mother, whether as a child, whether as a parent, whether as a lover, and feeling the pangs of separation from the divine, just the way a loved one feels the pangs of separation, is a whole part of this bhakti yoga. A notion of complete love, a notion of complete surrender. And it embodies the ethos that that complete surrender would only ensure a union with the Supreme Being. And what does this complete surrender mean? Just the way a loved one completely surrenders oneself to the Supreme Divine or to its lover. Similarly, if we detach ourselves from our entire material uh, attachments, my family, uh, my Jyotish classes, my dance classes, my office, my work, my children, if I am able to detach from all this, and I have my mind, body, and soul engrossed in the complete surrender of the divine. All I'm doing is like a long lost lover, just thinking of him and him only. But that is of course not possible for anybody who is in the material world. That is why bhakti yoga is a very, very difficult thing. 
uh, there is a misconception that oh bhakti yoga is something very sweet and maybe the other somebody who's only a tapasvi is the true yogi no bhakti yoga is the most difficult thing to have complete surrender and love that the entire act of one's being the very entire act of one's breathing uh, is uh, for God and for the Supreme Divine. And there is no other thought, such complete surrender. That's only when yoga occurs. Yoga means union. And the union is of this Jivatma with the Paramatma, of this soul with the Supreme Soul. So now let's pause and see how do we see in this horoscope. And before this, we are going to see how is bhakti different from religion how is devotion different from religion so uh, we are going to start by trying to look at trying to define what religion is now we see religion or dharma as it is called in sanskrit or in indian language we see that from the ninth bhava now all of you are most of you are well aware of that now as you know the very basically very basic points of the ninth bhava is that it is the bhagyasthana it is our destiny right it is the controller of the entire horoscope from the lord of the ninth house is a carrier of our prarabdha karma from the ninth house the navamsha or the ninth division of the varga is created and the navamsha is our destiny so because the ninth lord is a carrier of our prarabdha karma our destiny stems for that because it is the destiny that is why it is called the place of fortune or bhagyasthana bhagyasthana means the place of fortune so the ninth lord is the bhagyesha simultaneously an equally high status is given to the ninth house by calling it dharmasthana that is it is the domain of religion and that's why navamsha is also called dharmamsha and what is this dharma that we are talking about? It is also called the Pitristhana because we see our father, our fa or father like figures, our gurus, our teachers, our mentors, all these fatherly figures from whom we learn. And it is also the area of high education. The fourth bhava is the house of Vidya, as we all know, it is education. But from the fourth bhava, the ninth bhava is the sixth, so it's the growth of vidya. So we look at higher education in the Rashi chart from the ninth bhava. And what is this higher education? This is the higher education when we are going for graduation, going to college. It is also education as we are learning from all our gurus and our fathers. So we are learning a lot from our fathers and gurus and thereby we are accruing knowledge. So the ninth house, we are accruing knowledge in a very high way, okay? Because this bhava, it is to do with dharma, and that is why Jupiter is the karaka of this bhava. What is this dharma we are talking about? Both religion and dharma. It is a religion or that we have learned from our fathers. I mentioned here that from our fathers, from our teachers, from our gurus, we are learning from all of them. We are accruing knowledge. So religion or dharma is something that we are learning from our fathers. That is why this is known as Pitri Dharma. Those of you who are familiar with Sanskrit or Indian language, and those of you come from India, you know we use the term Pitri Dharma very often, very loosely. Okay, now let us see what is the definition of religion. Now, this is the dictionary definitions. This is my uh, summation of the dictionary definitions of what religion is. And the top part, which is the pink part, which is the main thing, which is from the Oxford uh, OED. It says that religion is a pursuit or it is an interest or it's a movement. And I like this word movement out here which is followed with great devotion, belief in or acknowledgement of some superhuman power or powers or God or a gods. And it requires from us obedience, reverence and worship and activities which are related to this worship. It defines a code of living in order to achieve these spiritual or material 
improvements. So it is a system of faith, it is a system of worship, but I think what is the most important thing is that it is a way of life, it is a way of living, it is an entire order, it's a system. It's a system which is defining a code of living. It is assuming that there is a superhuman power at the controlling helm by a god or gods, and there may be the teachings of a spiritual leader. So it is some sort of a movement. It is bound by religious vows, and one can belong to a particular religion, or there can be a denomination of a religious house. So it is like a very, very established movement. Right here, I have uh, show, given this photograph, which is of the Vatican City, where I think it's quite a very high uh, symbolism of organized religion. I mean, it's actually religion. I don't know why we use the word organized religion, but religion means this, that where it is assuming that you are believing in a particular God or a superhuman controlling power, you are uh, uh, you are believing in the teachings of a spiritual leader there is a system which is defining a code of living uh, there is performance of religious rites there is performance of observances and a life that is bound with religious vows which we have kind of uh, taken this up and we are usually born in it in a normal circumstances we are born in this religion we have learned it through maybe our family is part of a particular church uh, or a particular quorum or a particular community, and we have adhered to that. All right. And I'm not talking about, I know, like, for example, in the US, especially now, there is a lot of people who are experimenting and they are moving out and they are uh, listening to, uh, you know, changing their religion into a lot of things. But over here, we are believing that this is something that you inherited, that something that you learned, something that uh, you are learning from society as well. So it's a way of living. And many times people, here it says uh, the second line, which I don't ex exactly agree with, followed with great devotion. It does not need to be followed with great devotion. Oh, I'm following these practices because, you know, my family does it. I go to church on certain days or I do these practices, I do that practices because my parents did it and before them the grandparents did it. I don't have much faith in it, but I just do it anyway. This is religion with or without devotion. And we have this in all uh, religious uh, practices. Now, when we come into the definitions of the word dharma, it is even more, I would say, rigid in the sense the Vedic word for dharma was dharman and the definition the dictionary gives us is that which is established or firm that which is steadfast that means that which is nitya that which is established means that which is nitya perennial that which has been handed down by centuries it can also be a decree it can also be a statute. It can also be an ordinance or a law. But usages, practices, observances as a prescribed conduct. So I like this word prescribed conduct. Prescribed conduct is something that is very much uh, handed down to us. This is uh, what you observe customarily. This is what is the practice. You will see even in India, a lot of people who may not be well versed with the scriptures, well versed with, uh, you know, remedies and the deities, but they just follow certain things because that is the customary practice. It is a prescribed conduct. Oh, and so on, so day there is a Lakshmi Puja. They don't know as such details about Lakshmi. They don't know what is Purnima Tithi. Just, just know that this is a Tithi on where such a puja has to be conducted and they follow what the prescribed conduct is, which is handed down by a mother or a mother-in-law or whatever. So a lady of the house does that. Similarly, a man of the house will follow certain things handed down by the father. So it becomes like an ordinance or law. I like this definition of dharma, which I think... Uh, points out the rigidity of what the word religion means. It's like an ordinance. 
it's like a law it's like a statute by itself that which has become established that which is completely uh, perennial that which is anitya along with customary practices and usages now dharma also means that which is right and just that which is virtue virtuous and that which is moral so it is associated with morality and virtuosity and justice so religion prescribes an ethical code and i think this code is there across religions whether you have it in christianity or in uh, buddhism in islam definitely in hinduism there is a it's a ethical code you should do this you should not do that all right i mean uh, you you should not uh, thieve you should not co covet thy neighbor's wife you should do these things you should not you should touch the feet of a brahmin you should wash your hands before there's a whole stream of code of morality is there whole stream we all know this and uh, in the vedic tradition this entire laws we really have these ethical norms and laws encoded in a group of texts which are known as the dharma shastras now it would be very very interesting for you to know that the dharma shastra the origin of the dharma shastras was actually in a vedanga you know very well that jyotish is a vedanga right so there are six vedangas or the limbs of the vedas and that is uh, nirukta kalpa vyakarana chhanda shiksha and jyotisha these are the six limbs of the vedas it's very high up in the echelons in the entire group of vedic texts out of the six vedangas jyotish is a vedanga and jyotish is known to be the eyes of the veda and one of the other vedangas is here what i've written here is called kalpa kalpa means that which is imaginary that which is imagination very interesting though it doesn't mean that it's a treatise on imagination so this kalpa vedanga was the first uh, kind of vedic scripture which really started encoding these ethical laws now isn't that very interesting it started encoding these vedic what we call these ethical laws and ethical norms and all these ethical norms and laws which are pertaining to dharma emerging from this kalpa vedanga was strung together and from it emerged something called dharma sutras now there are many many dharma sutras and lot of the dharma sutras have been lost and you can see it's largely the rishis who really have put together these dharma sutras so the four main dharma sutras which actually uh, exist today are the apastamba sutra the gautama sutra the bodhayana sutra and the vashishta sutra these four are still existing dharma sutras which have emerged from the kalpa vedanga the other sutras are lost and from these sutras much later what developed were a whole group of shastras the texts and very interestingly these shastras were actually in the form of smritis smritis you know vedic tradition is in the form of smritis and in the form of shrutis smritis mean that which you have learned through hearing and shruti means that which you have heard through uh, sorry smriti means that which you have learned through memory and shruti means that which you have learned through hearing so this entire groom of dharma shastras which emerged at a much much later time much later time and the the main sutras are which exists are manu smriti yagya valkya smriti narada smriti and vishnu smriti all right these are the main things so what i'm saying is that the main texts for our dharma this encoding of ethical norms okay that we are talking about as there in all religions and i'm talking about vedic tradition so he for us it emerged from the vedanga called kalpa the whole tenets of dharma or religion and these from these tenets a whole bunch of sutras dharma sutras emerged and out of these dharma sutras which were all guided and written by rishis only four are actually existing and from these four that is apastamba gautama bodhayana and vashishta that emerges what is known as the dharma shastras 
and of these dharma shastras are existing as memory texts meaning as smritis and manu smriti yagya valka smriti narada smriti vishnu smriti these are the main ones now yagya valka smriti and manu smriti are very important in fact manu smriti seems to be very important manu smriti seems to have a lot of the coding which is there what you should do the entire varna system is there in manu smriti how the varnas should behave with each other is there in the manu smriti how a man should behave to the woman what is the status of the woman in society which i may add is not very i mean a very uh, complimentary but all that is there in the manusmriti what are the do's and don'ts of marriages they're all in a manusmriti the entire book of ethics and norms is manusmriti and manusmriti emerges much 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 later down the line i mean traditionally the marriage decree the marriage vows and the definition of marriage the whole marriage ceremony is actually in the veda it is in the veda from the rig veda but what people often take is what is there in the manusmriti which has become a book of ethical conduct and people now uh, who do not even know much will say oh this is written in manusmriti oh in manusmriti they talk about um casteism you know india is such a caste society it's all there in the manusmriti uh, oh you know they look upon women like that it's all there in the manusmriti so manusmriti becomes the yardstick like the book of religion never mind what the veda said never mind anything else said one little manusmriti has become so look at the importance of what this religion is what dharma is this encoded law the encoded statute now there are other smritis more than the ones i have written for example there is very famous brihaspati smriti but the brihaspati smriti is more to do with uh, the judiciary the justice and the justice system so we can see that in all society now in islam you know the sharia is there how the sharia is built up and formed as the books of coded law now all this is dharma what does this have to do with devotion and love for the supreme divine this doesn't seem to have anything to do with it right this is all very very ninth house now we said that the centuries of encoding they do not only create smritis and shastras but they create these customary usages of practices and observances and which are largely taught from father to son as pitri dharma and it is also taught by our religious institutes so our father or our mother teaches this to us right uh, say if somebody is born in a brahmin family the father or the mother will be teaching that to the child this is what you should do this how you should go to a temple this this is how you should practice with other communities or you should wear a yagya pavita uh, this is should be your conduct towards other people this is how you should behave with a wife and a child all these varieties of things are taught and handed down and a child whether they like it or they don't like it they accept and follow it isn't it i'm very sure what i'm talking about i'm talking about from the standpoint of an indian tradition or a vedic tradition uh, this is prevalent in all over the world where a religion is concerned uh, so should i stop here somebody is uh, uh, flashing a ch chat uh, out here there is no sound is there oh dear anyway let me just continue there's sound is anyone having oh. trouble with sound oh, i just oh, saw this one uh, one person chat box okay i'll continue yeah yeah so so whether we like it or not we are observing it religious practices you know you a child is growing up over here oh you know you must come you must fast on shivaratri you must attend the temple with me you must fast on a certain day you must not eat till up to a point till we actually uh, you know go and do puja uh, if you are doing puja in the house till you've done the puja you should not eat i mean many times the child or the person doesn't believe in these things this horoscope doesn't sustain a great religious or spiritual tendency they are just doing it in another case people are indifferent 
or they do believe in it and they are just doing it without applying their mind to it as to why they are doing it. We may be coming from a standpoint where we know, okay, we fast because we want to burn karmas. We are worshipping so-and-so de uh, deity on so-and-so day or so-and-so tithi because we know what it implies. But in general, unless somebody is into it, they would not know. They just do it as a customary usage. They do it as an observer. They do it because they have been taught by their father or the mother. Similarly, I'm sure in earlier times in in Christian households and Islamic houses, even till date, these things are done, that they must do it. There was a notion of reprimanding that if you don't do it, if you're not following, then you're breaking religion. Okay. So we learn this from our family because traditionally family meaning father, and that's why we are talking about it as Pitri Dharma. And we also learn it from the temple or the church. That's from a religious institution. You may be uh, accompanying your parents. Maybe a child is accompanying the parents and attends a Sunday service every Sunday. And uh, if a child is receptive, a person is receptive, the person also learns from the services that is being rendered by the reverend. Similarly, uh, uh, for us, that we may be going to religious institutes and we've been listening to religious sermons or religious talks or lectures. And if you're receptive, then it goes inside you and you listen to it. If you're not receptive, then your mind is like a sieve. So we do learn also from the temple and the church who are embodiments of religion. We do learn from that. And then in many cases, those of us who are spiritual, who we grow up and we get initiated and have a guru. And I'm sure in across all cultures, all other religions as well, you may have a guru in a different way. You may have somebody who's like a spiritual mentor. And that means I have chosen to educate myself on this. I have chosen to learn from this. And because I've chosen to educate myself and chosen to learn from this, I have decided to get initiated. That is also ninth house. We see diksha or initiation from the ninth house. We see the spiritual guru from the ninth house, right? We, of course, see all teachers from the ninth house, but this is also there. So when I take a diksha or a spiritual initiation of any kind, it is a voluntary step forward. It is not just Pitri Dharma or that which I learned when I accompanied my parents or uh, heard at the temple or church, but it is also something I decide that I want to further myself in the spiritual path and I take the Diksha and then I learn over there and I learn there through practice. They tell us, okay, this is the mantra, mantra uh, and you know, this will develop that spiritual quotient inside you. But all this learning, what happens to this learning? What is the aim of all this learning? Are we just following uh, the religion or the dharma? Are we just following it because it's just a religion, because we just have to do it? But if we have heard all these things, are we in a position then to convert this into knowledge? This is as yet not converted into knowledge, right? This is just a learning process. And it may just go down the drain if I'm not interested in it. But it's a learning process. But from learning all this from my parents, from the institute, from the church, have I then reflected on it? Have I then meditated on it? Have I then studied it further? Have I digested and converted into a knowledge? Because the, uh, the benefit or the result, if I may use the word, or the purpose will only happen if this gets transformed. This thing, this whole process that I discussed, this, which I'm very sure almost all of you are aware of this process, what I'm talking about, but what do we do with this process is the main question. Are we able to convert this? Are we able to convert this into a higher understanding, into a higher transformation and higher knowledge? If we are able to do that, only then bhakti will come. 
Till then, it is not bhakti. Till then, these are just norms and practices and codes and observance, observances and it's just a dharma that we follow and we go to church. There is no devotion in that sense. There is no bhakti here. Bhakti in the sense of devotion. No bhakti here. Bhakti only comes into those of us here who are able to crystallize and transform that knowledge. All right, here. This is uh, the shiksha is the education that we are gaining. And we have to convert this shiksha into jnana, that is knowledge. Only then will I get bhakti. So the shiksha, the learning I'm getting is from the father and the teacher and my spiritual guru, if any, or in general, uh, you know, the religious teachers and heads. And I have to convert that into knowledge. Only if I'm able to, how many of us are able to? Most people, they do it and they're not interested. This is what we talked about. But there are few of us who are interested. And if you're interested, then we probe deeper into it and we convert it into knowledge or jnana. Now, when there is this crystallization of jnana, when jnana actually occurs, it happens through reflection, through studies, through meditation, even through sadhana. Sometimes a person, uh, the first step, I think, is to get initiated. They may think that I want to take a step forward and get initiated. And they get initiated and then they get a mantra and they do the practice. Often that moves them into a higher level. Or just reflection on it, studies on it, reading more on it, or doing meditation on it makes them into another level. Because only then that the education we have received in the ninth house about this dharma or religion transforms it to a bhakti or to devotion. So what is this transformation? This is like a reflection of the ninth bhava. The ninth bhava has to reflect itself. All right? The ninth bhava is all this dharma we talked about. So this dharma has to reflect itself. And what is reflection? But reflection in Jyotisha is examined through the principle of bhavad bhavam, which I'm sure most of you know. So the bhavad bhavam of the ninth house is in the fifth house. So the reflection of all this knowledge, of all this shiksha that we have accrued in the ninth bhava, if we are able to transform it, then it will get reflected back into the fifth house through the principle of bhavad bhavam. All right, that is why the fifth house is the crystallized distilled knowledge as a reflection of dharma. Okay. So we see bhakti from the fifth house because then bhakti is nothing but this reflection of digested knowledge from dharma. Therefore, we are seeing bhakti in the fifth house because the fifth house is the bhavad bhavam of the ninth house. We are not seeing bhakti from fourth house or from the lagna or from the twelfth house. We are not seeing bhakti from any other houses. We are seeing bhakti from the fifth house. And the reason we are seeing bhakti, many of you know we see bhakti from the fifth house, but the reason we are seeing bhakti from the fifth house, because it is the bhavad bhavam of the ninth house, that bhakti is the end result, is the end result when the ninth house is able to reflect itself. Okay? So I hope you people are with me uh, so far. I want you to take a, a a moment and digest what I'm saying. I repeat that last line, that bhakti is nothing but the end result. This is a reflection. All this religion, all my code of conduct, all my practice, all my learning, what did that result in if it was able to result in then it will show itself in the fifth house but for many most people it doesn't right many of us it does and that is what we call bhakti which we see it now let us examine the fifth house a little bit amongst various other things the one of the most important thing we learn is that the fifth house is the chitta bhava 
And what is chitta? Chitta is a very, very important concept. Chitta is something that links the mind and the buddhi or the intelligence. The intelligence, which is the dhi, and the manas, which is the mind, they are interlinked. Chitta is the seat of the mana, and this crucial interlinkage is there in the fifth house, an extremely delicate house in the entire horoscope. So it is the seat of the mana. All right. The traditional Vedic meaning of chitta is thinking, reflecting, imagining, and also the heart and the mind. All right. So we are incorporating the definition of thinking and reflecting in it, as well as we are incorporating the notion of the heart and the mind in it. So there is a heart, which means there's emotion. We are talking about the mind and we are talking about thinking and we are talking about imagining. All this connective thing happens in the fifth thousand that is called chitta. Very, 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 very uh, delicate bhava. In the fifth house, the buddhi also actually has its play and works itself out or digests itself out. Of course, as you know, that the natural fifth house is loaded by Surya. So that is the place where it does it. And here, when we are talking about thinking, we are also referring to the perceptive power. Here, the important word is the perceptive power, the reflective and the meditative ability to ingest and interpret knowledge. So you can learn the buddhi or the dhi or the intelligence can perhaps be very high and read and understand a lot of knowledge. But are you able to convert that knowledge into wisdom? Are you able to convert that knowledge into discernment? Wisdom will only come from knowledge if there is that moral element in us, if there is that discerning power in it. Okay, and this discerning power to make judgments, which might ultimately be moral, is called viveka. You know, in Sarvartha Chintamani, uh, Kalyana Verma has called this the fifth power, has a viveka shakti, he calls it. So what is viveka? Viveka is a conscious decision, is a, con is a very uh, conscious moral decision. And this moral decision, which is emanating after a lot of grinding and thinking about a set of knowledge that's given to you. By applying some perceptive power, by applying reflection, meditation, and depending on how, how your sense of perceptivity is, how far your discerning power is, this is Viveka, the discerning power. That is what makes one person a jnani, a great wise person. Somebody can have 10 degrees in a university, the highest degrees, that doesn't make him a jnani or a wise person. A wise person like a wise and rishi or a saint, that means such people have a discerning power. They're able to reflect on knowledge. They're able to interpret knowledge and make judgments which will be ultimately moral. That is very important. And that is why Viveka. This is also there in the fifth house. Again, a linkage between, as we can see, between the ability to think and bringing in a moral quotient to it. So the linkage between mana and buddhi is also over there. The another very important part is that the mana or the mind is also associated with ridaya. Ridaya means heart. And the chitta is then linking this viveka shakti with the mana. So ridaya is very, very important. So it's a, it's a very difficult chitta, is a very difficult concept to explain. But this chitta is seated in the fifth house is called chitta bhava that is why you will see that he is in the lagna or paka lagna you will see the manas or the heart is there in the fourth house but the fifth house is chitta bhava and you will ask what is chitta and chitta is, as i said not the same as mana but it is the seat of mana and it is that which links mana with the discerning power with the heart so the heart and our discerning power of our intelligence and our mind and our moral judgment is all coming together over there. That is why it is called chitta, very delicate house. All right.
before I come into this, I also want to tell you one more thing that because this house is so delicate and the mana, it is a seat of the mana, that is why mantras are seen from this house. One of the reasons, because the mantras protect the mind. I'll come to mantras later. There is a deeper meaning why mantras are seen from this house. Before I go into that, there is another concept that I would like to bring to you. And this concept is about the concept of the tongue, that the fifth house, we have the tongue. So there is something called the five Gyanendriyas. You know, in the Vedic tradition, we have called the 10 sense organs. Five of them are called the Gyanendriyas and five of them are called Karmendriyas. That means five of them actually are uh, perceptory Indriyas or knowledge Indriyas and the other are action-oriented Indriyas. Now, in the horoscope, these uh, five Indriyas are actually placed in order from the first to the fifth house. And many of you may be quite aware of this. So in the first house, it is the Dvak, all right, which means it is the skin. The second house, it is Chakshu, which means it's the eyes. The third house is a Surotra, which means it's the ears. The fourth house, it is Grana, which means the nose. The fifth house, it is the Rasana, or which means the tongue. These are the Tvak, Chakshu, Srotra, Grana, Rasana, are supposed to be the five sense organs. All right, skin, eyes, ears, nose, and tongue. And we map it from the first to the fifth house. Okay. And then we have something called Jnana Tattva or Tanmatras. Tanmatras are what these Indriyas are doing. So, Tvak, the Tanmatra or Tvak is Parsha, that is to touch. And we see that from the ninth house. The Tanmatra of Chakshu are the eyes. What does the eyes behold? They behold a form which we see from the 10th house. Uh, that is why you people are very much aware that if there are malefics in the 10th house, it means that you can have some eye diseases or eye ailments. That means you're unable to see the form properly. You can see the form, Rupa means form. You can see the form very well only if your eyes, eyesight is very well because this vision comes from sense of Agni, okay? Thwak comes from skin, which kind of binds the whole thing together. And the skin gives the tanmatra of sparsha or touch. From the third house, we get the gyanendri of years or srotra. All right. And what is the tanmatra of srotra? But it is shabda, which we get in the 11th house. So similarly, if you have malefics in the 11th house, which means you are going to have some issues with hearing. These things already many of you, I'm very sure, are aware of who have been. This is very much our uh, parampara knowledge, which I'm sharing with you. And uh, so those who, those of you who are studying with us are probably already aware of this. The fourth house we say is grana or nose, and the tanmatra of that is gandha or smell, and which we see in the 12th house. And the fifth house is rasana. Rasana means tongue. And tanmatra, that what it does, is rasa, or which is taste. We are going to talk really largely about the last point out here. From a Jyotish point of view, the Jyotish explanation that we give over here, that what is the dharma, that what is the dharma of the skin but to touch, what is the dharma of the eyes, it is but to see, what is the dharma of the ears, but it is to hear, what is the dharma of the nose, but it is to smell that is its work. What is it supposed to do? It is supposed to smell. What are the ears supposed to do? They are supposed to hear, right? What are the eyes supposed to do? They are supposed to behold. Similarly, what is the tongue supposed to do? It is supposed to taste. That is why it is shown ninth from the houses. If you see that the ninth house is obviously ninth from the first house and the 10th house is ninth from the second house and 11th is the ninth from the third house and the 12th is the ninth from the fourth house and the flagna, the first house is the ninth from the fifth house. Ninth meaning dharma, that which you're supposed to do. We just talked about dharma and religion, right? So that is what they are supposed to do, they are doing. So we don't now need to bother with all these other, the first four lines. What we need to bother here right now, what, uh, interests us is this fifth line 
all right that the tongue is there uh, in the fifth house and the tongue tongue is called rasana in sanskrit it's also called jiva but when uh, the vedic texts are describing ganindriyas they are referring uh, to it as rasana actually and what does rasana mean so what does rasana mean rasana means that it is all about taste and it is all about flavor we are talking about taste and flavor it is the activation of the rasas it is associated with emotions because rasas are in, involved or associated with emotions why are rasas associated with emotions uh, again in a shastra a natya shastra that is the scriptures which deal with dance in the natya shastra it is given very clearly that the emotions stem from the rasas that there are six rasas or seven rasas and the emotions stem from there so the rasas are like juice juices they are fluids it is not just the saliva or the flavor in the mouth but all the juices in the body and they are the carrier of rasas as jyotishi is is very easy for us to understand because here we are talking about jala tattva moment rasas coming we are talking about jala tattva and emotions is all to do with jala tattva now we say that if the tongue of the rasana is in the fifth house the taste is in lagna all right the taste is there in lagna the rasa is actually there in lagna so though the second house and the second lord is to do with eating and consumption if you have a prominent planet in the lagna that graha or the rasa or the taste of that graha will surely indicate to you what you like to eat more than anything else would you agree with that more than anything else the graha in the lagna will indicate if you have a strong desire jupiter in lagna strong desire for sweets and butter and ghee and things like that so lot of people go blindly into looking at second house we say no the real taste the real rasa is there if you have a planet in lagna now to come back as we said that jyotish tells us that rasa is to do with jala tattva and jala tattva is associated with emotions we have already said that the fifth house is the seat of the manas because it is the chitta bhava and chitta is the seat of manas so fifth house is replete with a lot of emotions the mind is over there the rasa is over there the emotions are activated very highly hence we see everything related to emotions over there we see love and love affair from fifth house we do not see love and love affair from the seventh house from the seventh house we see our sexual partners we see mating we see if we are going to meet somebody and we are going to mate with somebody we see that the partner we see in the seventh house all partners isn't it we see business partners as well but we see the, our partners over there in the 12th house we have the priest sitting and if we get engaged in the third house the priest in the 12th house will bring us to the altar but what about the heart we are not talking about a partner and marriage we are talking about the heart and we are talking about falling in love blindly and about love so this love is seen from fifth house oh dear a moon and rahu in fifth house a venus and rahu in fifth house hugely highly problematic affairs of the heart so if we see that which emotions which drive the mind we also see love for the nation somebody who has desha bhakti or a great patriot who loves his motherland that also we see from the fifth house now if we go back and we see that the fifth was the reflection of religion or the reflection of dharma that is a digested knowledge of dharma if able to be reflected then it gets reflected in the fifth house then what is that manifestation of that reflection that reflection gets manifested in emotional forms in an emotional way the expression is emotional because the fifth house is all about rasa and emotion because of the because of the tongue because of the rasana as well as because of the positioning of the manas so the expression that we are having of that reflection of that digested knowledge from the ninth house the expression is in an emotional way 
that is that emotional expression of my complete devotion to the Supreme Divine is called Bhakti. All right, and hence it is expressed in high octaves of love, in high octaves of devotion, and in high octaves of surrender. This is what I started with. I mentioned this to you right in the beginning. And here you can see a picture of, uh, as I told you, baby Krishna with his adopted mother, Yashoda. And Yashoda really, really loved him. So we don't have stories about him with his birth mother. His birth mother was Devaki. But we don't hear stories about him and Devaki. We hear stories about him and his adopted mother, which is Yashoda. And Yasoda absolutely loved him. And he would, like a young child, like a little Mercury, would play games with her, would go and break her pots of cream, where all the mothers were there. You know, they would churn milk. They were all cow herds. So his mother and all the other aunties in the place, they would churn milk and make curd and cheese and butter from it and it would be hanging and he'd go and he would be eating them up and they will come and admonish him oh look at you little gopala you are eating up all our cream eating up all our dahi eating up all our cheese that we have made oh you naughty boy and give him a little spank and then they would put all those pots right up on top and then what did this little boy do? He'll take stones and break it. He will climb and make a mountain with other children and break it and eat up all those coats and curds and creams and milk and yogurt. And all the aunties and mothers would go, oh God, what do we do with this boy? This whole drama, this whole story, which many of you are so well aware of, this is known as a Leela. Leela means this is a play of God, that God takes... Uh, uh, the Supreme Divine takes birth, which is known as an avatar, as an incarnation, as a human form, to play out, to enact a drama by which he teaches us how to have a relationship with him. These are all yogas. Yoga means union between one soul and the other, between the jivatma and the paramatma. So here in this picture, as you can see, that is through his little Bala Leela. He's showing us that is a love. This is bhakti. This is a total reflection of dharma, total digest, total bhakti. So the bhakti is that of mothers to a child, of a mother to a child. Oh, you naughty boy, I'll spank you. I told you not to touch the yogurt, touch the cottage cheese. You've done it again. Let me see what you do. I will beat you. I will spank you. And then at the same time, I will hug you and I'll cuddle you. And here you can see, as a punishment, the mother is tying baby Krishna. Oh, he's done something naughty. He must be tied up. Naughty boy, I'll spank you. So this relationship is called Batsalya Rasa, that the play between a mother and a child is uh, through that is a way of love, that you have that surrender, that you have that love. This is called bhakti, just the way a mother has to a baby. And the divine's relationship with us is symbiotic, that he is also going to be with us in that way. That is why they say that if you really yearn from him, our gurus tell us that if you yearn for him in this way, yearn for him in this manner, he will surely come to us. But have you yearned for him in this manner? Or are you just following religion in a ninth house kind of a way. I have to do this, I have to do that. This is my dharma, this I just belong to a movement, it's encoded, no. Are you doing that or are you instigating the rasana, the rasas of the fifth house? That is, are you in the flow of bhakti? Are you following what I'm doing? Are you all with me on this? I keep on seeing this flashing chat box and uh, you know, I, I don't know what's going on. I'll have to again see that flashing chat box. Oh, okay. There are some questions for you in the oh, chat okay. box. So I just, yeah, um, so what I want to do is I want to uh, just uh, finish this section and then do the questions. So that is okay, right, Deborah? Yes, that's fine. People okay. are just logging them there. Oh, okay, fine. So we, this chat box keeps on kind of beeping and flashing, so I kind of think something is going on. So You're good. Okay, so that is what we call bhakti. This relationship 
where he is my now this whole cult of loving gopala as baby krishna is called loving gopala and tending to him it is practiced across uh, uh, many part of uh, india most parts of india so people have baby gopala and they have his little uh, you know little cushion where he sits on they make a uh, sweets for him and then on certain tithis they will make him a little swing and he swings on it and they do all kinds of things and people's uh, i've heard this this is in everywhere this is even in bengal where it is con considered to be a great shock the country even there people have this gopal tradition and they'll say oh no you know my gopal did this and gopal did that they refer to gopal when i was young i used to think that who is this gopal they are talking about little knowing they are talking about krishna's bal gopal who was reinstated in their house you know and that they are treating him like this as a householder that's a very high surrender path very supreme surrender okay then we have of course the uh, allegory of sri radhika all right we have the allegory of sri radhika where sri radhika acts the, which many people mistaken as if that's a conjugal love that is a love between a man and a woman the attraction the language the poetry the songs they're all talking about uh, love out there okay and but this love again is a love of surrender that is that she is that ultimate that if you can love like her and the way then you are assured the path of mukti mukti is not assured unless you have sri radhika that's why they say krishna and sri radhika go hand in hand their names go hand in hand so it is all right to worship sri krishna but if you don't have sri radhika you really can't have moksha because she is your path to moksha because you have to have her and her path and the way she has loved him yearn for him the way she has yearned that is a surrender that is what is called bhakti and when there is a separation if from my for my work from my material life i have moved away from this i have moved away then my heart should pang for him should have this huge desire for him and this it's just the way it's called viraha and it is just the way a lover pines and pangs for the loved one that is the embodiment which sri radhika is showing pining for krishna we should pine for the divine in that way so we should want krishna in that way either the way jasoda has looked after the aunties have looked after here as a child or the way sri radhika has yearned for radha the gopis all sri radhika's millions of sisters and attendants around uh, him who have yearned for him you have to yearn for him that is bhakti we are seeing all this in the fifth house okay because you have to be very very clear as you know as i said many of you know this in a more perhaps headline form but i wanted this to get through to you why it is so that surrender and that yog which will come only from the uh, fifth house now right from parashara to all the other texts like jataka parijata jataka tattva the shukanari they have all told us how we can see our spiritual path and deities from the fifth house okay this i have just given only uh, two shlokas out here for you where uh, brihat parashara they have said yantra mantra tatha vidya yantra and mantra can be seen from here jataka parijata said putra daiva mahisha daiva everything that is divine everything that is related to the divinity everything that is related to yantra and mantra we should see from the fifth house so when i was first studying jyotish i always wondered why from the fifth house okay then i understood mantra maybe it is to do with the mana which is true of course mantra is very important because of that and then which my next round of my uh, my talk is going to be about uh, how even they all give a variety of combinations a variety of sutras to show how you can see various deities for example parashara has told us that if there is a linkage between the fifth and fourth house of the horoscope that or between the fifth and fourth lords it shows that there is a vishnu bhakti that you are a vishnu bhakta 
All right. Or if there is a linkage between the fifth and seventh house, then you are a Shaiva, you are a Shiva Bhakta. Actually, he also says that you would be interested in many language, religions because uh, seventh house is also the door for us to connect to the world. We connect to the outside world through the seventh house. So you can actually connect to a lot of spiritual paths, but Shiva Bhakti is over there. And the fifth and fourth is shown as Vishnu Bhakti. Similarly, he's given a lot of other combinations. Uh, Shukanari has given a lot of combinations. Jataka Tattva has given combinations. And so they see in this way, we see our spiritual paths. Now, we did talk about that the fifth bhava is so delicate, right? that it needs to be purified, that it needs to be uh, cleansed continuously, that it needs to be, uh, that the chitta needs to be kept totally blemish free. The chitta has to be spotless. Remember, the viveka is coming from there. Therefore, a planet in the fifth house, we need to worship the deity related to that planet in order to purify that chitta. Not only will it purify my chitta, but because it is a bhakti bhava, we will have a natural attraction, an unwritten, unknown attraction indicated for that deity. That attraction may come at a time when you know you are younger, the attraction may come at a time when you are much older. But that attraction, the great attraction would be there because of the triggering of the rasas. Remember, that is there from past life or whatever that is in the template of your horoscope. So now, if I have a son in the fifth house, so does that mean uh, I need to worship Agni or I need to worship Surya? Definitely you can be a worshipper of Surya. Definitely you can be a worshipper of the Gayatri Mantra. But no, the attraction, the real thing that you should be worshipping is you should be worshipping Shiva out there. Okay, your aim should be to worship Shiva out there because Shiva, as Parashara tells us, is the Pratyadi Devata of the planet Surya. Jataka Tattva tells us, Surya in the fifth house, you should worship Shankara, which is another name of Shiva. So why have they said all these things? Because you do need a high level of deity. The way a deity is a pratyadhi devata, that level of deity, because the attraction is to the higher deity. Because there are two fold things that we are talking from over here. We are saying that the fifth house is a reflection of the ninth, right? So we have already crossed over the initial things about religion. And we are already in a bhakti mode where we are already, we are reflecting that religion which we have absorbed. Naturally, we are aspiring to worship the higher deities out there. Our worship, our interest, our afflictions should be for the higher deities, not for the lower deities. We want to reach higher and higher. The rasa, the attraction or the bhakti would be for that. Surya and fifth house will give a lot of passion for Shiva. But I'm also saying that we should also do that because being Chitta Bhava, only a very high form of a devata associated with the graha. High form meaning like a pratyadi devata would be uh, desirable. So if Surya is in the fifth house, we would ideally would like to worship Shiva. If moon is in the fifth house, all right, we would not like to worship Jaladevi over there, who is the adi devata or the graha devata. We would like to worship, say, Durga or Devi of any form over there, a high form over there. If it is Mercury, we would like to worship Vishnu. If you have fifth Lord Mercury in fourth house, you must worship Vishnu. If Mercury is there in the fifth house, you must worship Vishnu. That means that deity would lead you more to the path of devotion, that the path of bhakti that you've embarked on, which you want to flow, bhakti is all about flowing, then you will flow and flow and flow further in it. <clears throat> if you take that, the planets over there are indicating to us that, hey, look, why don't you take this? If we have Jupiter over there, we can then worship either Sadashiva or Mahavishnu, like a very high form because Jupiter is Sat Tattva. So there is a Tattva cleansing that is also happening over there. 
fifth house, there is a tattva cleansing that is happening because the chitta, I said, should be blemish free. The mana should be cleansed. So the cleansing is always at a tattva level. So that tattva cleansing is happening. So if there is Surya, then worship Shiva, that is my path. If there is Chandra, worship Durga or her forms, Parvati or whoever, that is the path. If there is Mercury, then I would worship Vishnu, that is the path. And if there is Jupiter, then it's a very high Sattva Guna. I can worship Shiva or Vishnu, but in a very high level, like either Sadashiva or Mahavishnu or Jagannatha, that form very high form or a very high form of guru. I was wanting to actually throw up Satsri's chart who has fifth Lord Jupiter in the Lagna. Such complete, now you see fifth Lord in Lagna. You, I showed you the linkages between Rasana and Rasa, the tongue and the taste. She has that over there. Her entire bhakti, her entire flow, her entire Rasa is flowing towards the guru. There is no secondary thing for her. It is all going over there. I always feel blessed are those with a horoscope like this. If there is Mangal, we may be attracted to, say, Hanuman over there, because Kanda people don't worship. So you can be a great lover or worshipper of Hanuman. If Venus is over there, then of course we will be a great lover or worshipper of the Divine Mother in other forms. Shiva can show Rudra. So this is one thing. So that what I wanted to do in the next phase is to show to you uh, that the various schemes of what these deities are. Jataka Tattva is given, Jataka Pari Jata is given, the Shukanari is given, Brihat Parashar is given, Jaimini is given generally, but not related to the fifth house. So this entire thing why the fifth house and why have all these astrologers talked about that worship the planet, worship the deity or the devata associated with the planet in the fifth house or having a strong linkages with the fifth house. Why well, have so many of them across to the extent Parashara stems and talks about fifth house from Karakamsha to see what you would be very good at. The whole stress of fifth house is because that I explained this is because of this bhakti, because that is the real flow where your spiritual path is. Your real spiritual path is coming from the fifth house and not from the ninth. Ninth is giving you norm and order and structure and religion. But the real spiritual flow is happening from the fifth house. So uh, we probably take that part to how to identify the deities, what are the different scheme of deities, different and the path, your spiritual path that you will have shown by the planet, which is there in the uh, in the fifth house. Uh, and we can also do a whole host of horoscopes and analyze it, which is going to be uh, on another day in a second part. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, then um, shall I, I'd like to end it over here. And uh, so shall I take questions now, Deborah? Sure. Uh, do you do you see them or would you like me to read them or what would be best? Yeah, I can see them. I can okay. see them. I just need to scroll up. Yeah, how about the yoga between the ninth Lord and the fourth Lord and that between the fourth and the fifth Lord? Yeah, this is what I said. The You see, the fifth house, you must understand, is the most important thing, right? So association of the fifth Lord with other houses will show the exact nature of the spiritual path. So if there's an association between the fifth and the fourth house, we say that's a Vaishnava path. This is one example. And as I said in the next, next class, I will do these things in great detail because there is a lot of Jyotish text talks about it in a different ways. Uh, the fifth and the uh, seventh house, uh, I will talk about Shiva Bhakti. Uh, the ninth and the fifth house, this is Parashara has told us that if there is an association between ninth house and the fifth house, that means dharma and bhakti have come together, then that is very perfect according to many scriptures. 
ninth lord in the fifth, fifth lord in the ninth, ninth and fifth lord together in the fifth or ninth. Okay. Ninth and fourth, we are not looking at because I'm not looking at the true spiritual path is not seen from the ninth house. This is what, what I spent last one are talking that the bhakti, the devotion, the actual spiritual path is coming from the fifth house through bhakti, and that is called bhakti. Okay, there's a, another question from Praveen. Uh, does a yoga between, yeah, this is what I exactly explained. He said, uh, does a yoga between fifth lord and ninth lord indicate the potential for bhakti? Is that right? It indicates it's very, very perfect. Of course, it's a very good combination. That such a person would have bhakti as well as the person would be very um, duty bound and following and observing rituals as well. You know, there are some people who observe rituals as well as they are very spiritual. So they have their ninth house developed and the reflection of it that it has culminated in devotion and bhakti that is also developed and they have both in unison. Then that is very good. Of course, goes without saying. Yeah, ninth and fourth. Why are we going to look at ninth and fourth? My focus is on the uh, fifth. Fourth and fifth, I've said. Mm. Yeah, uh, Praveen. Praveen's question is that how do we see pure unalloyed bhakti and bhakti mixed with gunas in the chart? Now, I think your question is a little bit you're mixed up. You said nirguna bhakti. Are you talking about bhakti for the nirguna form? Because pure unalloyed bhakti is seen from the fifth house. That we will do in analysis of chart. And you can have pure unalloyed bhakti, whether for guna or for nirguna form. Are you trying to say that Meera's bhakti for uh, Krishna, that it was uh, not unalloyed? It is absolutely pure bhakti what Meera had, but that is a guna form. So I think what you're asking is how do we decipher whether the bhakti is for a nirguna path or whether it's for this weekend. This is what I'm going to do next time because there is a whole structure of seeing the deities and then we identify this. It, it's there for the second part of this. I was kind of hoping that I would uh, do it perhaps in this part, but uh, you know, this first part is pretty heavy. So I decided to split it in two one hour parts instead of one two hour parts with the uh, permission of the organizers. Ah, <laughs> this is a very important uh, question. Uh, somebody's asked that what are some ways, how can we decide that the love is shown in the fifth house as love, love for deity or love for nation versus love affair? See, again, this is a question, uh, this is the uh, question for uh, to be seen in the horoscope. Uh, for example, it will show everything. Say, I'll give you my example. If I have Venus and Rahu in the fifth house, all right. So uh, Venus afflicted by Rahu in the fifth house is not at all a good thing, which will mean that when I am young, then this matters of the heart are going to plague me. Rahu is afflicting Venus. Venus is a karaka for love. And definitely during those dashas, Rahu dasha, it will plague me and it will cause me a lot of uh, sort of distress and it all depends on the rest of the horoscope of course but it can also show me because it is in the fifth house that if I do the worship of the deities indicated by the planet by Venus and Rahu a combination of that then definitely then that is a path way out for me from that pain and even when I'm out of that pain that that is a way for me for everything okay uh, maybe I, I can, I'll show up on horoscope and we can do. Okay, this is uh, somebody else who's asked that when I was younger, I had much more pining for God, for the divine. Now I feel his or her presence. So the awful yearning is less. Does this mean my bhakti is gone? Must the divine lover must always be distant? No, it just means that I mean, as an astrologer, you will know we go through dashas. And this is what the dasha means. Dasha means the guna or the state of the mind. All right. And when there is this guna or the state of the mind um, is perhaps you are running a dasha related to a planet in the fifth house and which is promoting a lot of bhakti and spiritual uh, yearning in your chart. And you really 
you know, gone in that path. And then when the dasha changes, maybe something related to 10th house or 7th house, then the guna of the mind changes. Dasha means that that planet is having a doing a grahana with the guna of the mind. And your focus then goes towards other things. It doesn't mean, it means that you are separated. It is like a separation. So you are still, uh, you're a believer and you have that faith. But because of that, because of the dashas, you are separated and your mind is focused somewhere else. This is this is what happens to all of us in uh, different degrees and different ways, isn't it not? Oh, that was you, Deborah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Um, the yeah. last to remind. Um, and Satsiri, her internet is going in and out, but she had a question. This may, mm -hmm. have, may have answered this, but she asked, um, about the fourth and the fifth house, Chitta versus Mana and Hridaya. Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, what if she was able to listen to this whole thing? Uh, uh, I mean, that I talked about that at length. So, uh, the fifth oh. house is the seat of the Mana. The fourth house is the Manas, is the Hridaya in a different way is the Hridaya Chakra, the Mana, the pure Mana. It is ruled by the moon. But the fifth house is Chitta, which is a seat of the Mana. And the Chitta is connecting the Mana with the Hridaya and the thinking power, the discerning power. So there is an element of thinking, intelligence, and Mana and Hridaya, which is the combination, which is the Chitta Bhava. That is why the Chitta Bhava is so delicate, which is the fifth house. Whereas four thousand more Ridaya and Manas. Thank you. And uh, uh, the example uh, somebody asked about Nirguna. You know, Satsri's chart is a very, very good example. I mean, I've not put up the chart. I mean, I'm going to take all this up later, but I can just discuss it. She's Scorpio Lagna, so fifth Lord Jupiter is there in Lagna. Straight away, that's a very, very strong combination. As I said, that the Rasa and the Rasana is totally uh, connected. So there is, which means that there is a huge outflow of bhakti. That means there's a huge spiritual development in that direction of Jupiter. Jupiter alone in Lagna can not only mean Shiva, it can mean the Guru. And it can mean a Nirguna form, Praveen, what you were asking. So, you know, she is a worshipper of, she is in the Sikh path and she's a worshipper of the Omkara. She does the Ek Omkar Satanam. See, Jupiter alone over there is nothing but Omkar, and Omkar is representative of Nirguna. So I think in her horoscope, it is very, very showing very, very, very clearly. Thank you. We have another one from Praveen. Okay. I'm scrolling down. Uh, Scorpio Lagna people by default have the same Lagna and fifth Lord uh, Ketu, yeah. As one of the coolers, as a give them, yeah, they it can, it can definitely, it can give them, you know, the power to uh, see Scorpio uh, is the natural fifth house of the horoscope, which means they have the inner innate power of, of if the Ketu is very strong in the chart, then they can be very much. Um, attuned towards uh, occults and things like that, kundalini, meditation, occult, that kind of power, very much so, very much. It's a it's an eighth house connection, meaning the positive eighth house connection is with the kundalini, as well as it is with the, uh, with a lot of occult things. All right, such people can be very good in Jyotish. Okay, definitely. We will take, we will take these charts up. Any more questions? Yes, um, uh, Paul Barker just wants to confirm if there's no planet in the fifth house, do you take the Lord? Yeah, we take, yeah. More, we take the Lord and also we take aspects. Parashara has told us to take aspects. So I will be doing this part in the second half because this, this is another chunk by itself. How do we do it? And there is a variety of schemes of deities from a lot of texts. And uh, so I want to take that and uh, you know, and do horoscopes. That's the aim. And so, why, as I repeating it, my aim was that maybe I could have done it in like two hours at a stretch, but I decided to split it up. I think it's better. Okay. There's another question that if fifth I, house is the seat I'm of mana. Sorry. Yeah, that's that's just a set series repeat. I'm oh, not, okay. Okay, uh, you've already. And here's yeah. another one. Um, 
how to see the connection between our bhakti and attaining moksha, no more rebirth. What connections do we need to have in place with the fifth house and fifth lord? Yeah, so fifth house is therefore showing the bhakti and the path to moksha then is, from, is to the twelfth house. So we will see the twelfth house of the Rashi chart, but we need to see the twelfth house of the Navamsha chart. And we also need to examine this from the Karakamsha. So I'm not actually really wanting to go into Karakamsha here, but those who are uh, aware of Karakamsha, you must study this from Karakamsha as well as see the twelfth house from the uh, Navamsha chart, as well as see from Arura from the Rashi chart and the twelfth house of the Rashi chart as well. Yeah, and the connection of fifth lord or over there, connection of fifth house with these houses is definitely meaning you are in that path, definitely. Uh, Paul Barker wants to know if associations include Rashi Drishti. Yeah, we will do charts, Paul, horoscopes, and then it will become clear, okay? Uh, this because this just can't be done in a manner of formula. I want to do a whole series of horoscopes after showing all the, you know, the sutras for what are the deities. Then I can show you who took which path and, you know, how it manifested, okay? So I think that maybe uh, if you're good, uh, Sarbaniji, we should, um, we should conclude now and we will yeah. uh, let people know in part two of this wonderful and deep and uh, joyful subject is going to be uh, appearing in the new year. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you everybody oh. for attending and Sarbani, this was really wonderful. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. How do I get out of this? I'll I'll just end it.